Well, I became a voice actor because I couldn't draw. Um, I started out um, just as an actor. Uh, when I was young, I was inspired by people like Gene Kelly. I grew up watching a lot of MGM musicals that my parents used to have on Betamax tape back when that was a thing. And uh, um, I wanted to be, I, I got sort of the acting bug when I was younger. And I really wanted to be a sort of singer, actor, dancer like Gene Kelly. And so I did that all through high school and went into college, majored in theater, uh, minored in computer science, and then went on and got a master's degree at Columbia University for acting. Um, and so that was, I, I was on the acting trajectory doing that thing, but I had always been a big fan of uh, animation and specifically anime. I mean, I had grown up watching, mm, well, I'd watched a lot of cartoons growing up and then I realized that all my favorite cartoons just happened to be Japanese. And it wasn't until I was in high school that I understood that, like that I, I figured out that animation could come from different countries. Um, and so all the stuff I'd watch, uh, Speed Racer, Star Blazers, Battle of the Planets, Robotech was all Japanese. Um, and so then uh, I was working, after I graduated from grad school, I was working in a theater department, uh, no, a theater festival, Williamstown Theater Festival. And a friend of mine there caught me watching anime because I had gotten back into watching anime as an adult. And he offered to put me in touch with some of the studios in New York that were dubbing anime at the time. Um, and my first response was, I don't want to do that. The dubs are terrible. Um, but that's because I had been raised on dubs in like the 80s that were questionable at times. Um, but then I realized that that was how a lot of people got their introduction to anime. That was certainly how I got my introduction to anime. And I wanted that introduction to be as good as possible. So I reconsidered and I reached out to him again. I said, sure, I'll audition. What, what, what do they got? Um, and so he put me in touch with the studio and I started auditioning for roles. And luckily I, I booked some roles on some anime shows. Um, and I realized that that's what I could contribute to animation that my skill set was in the acting field, not necessarily in the drawing field. And so since I couldn't draw, um, what I could contribute to uh, animation, specifically anime, was, uh, was voice acting. I wish I knew. Uh, if someone could tell me, that would be great. Um, I, there is no normal day for a voice actor. Um, because that would assume that we're all working sort of regular nine to five jobs and clocking in the morning and clocking in at the night. At night, Any voice actor who is working that regularly is a superstar. Um, so, you know, there may be weeks where I have a lot of gigs lined up and so I'm recording stuff for different producers. And then there may be weeks where there's very little. Um, it's sort of uh, a feast or famine in a way. It's not consistent. Um, but <laughs> the effort you put into it is consistent because even if I'm not employed on a recording gig, I'm still auditioning. I'm still trying to improve my skills. I'm still doing research about shows and the voiceover marketplace and whatever I might be up to. Um, so it storytelling and animation and, and acting never really leaves my brain. If Even if the calendar only has me booked in the studio you know, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, Tuesday, Thursday, I'm still steeped in whatever I'm doing with other stuff. Um, so it, it totally depends. Well, I do watch, I mean, I watch storytelling. I, I haven't watched that much anime recently, mostly because the anime that I do watch is usually the stuff I'm working on. And my schedule is so busy that usually I take the time, if it's at all possible, if I can get my hands on the episodes ahead of time, I take the time to watch the shows I'm working on and to immerse myself in those shows. So I may know the shows I'm working on in, in and out, but um, I, don't, I don't always have a whole lot of spare time to watch other anime, unless something comes along that is just not to be missed, that is sort of a seminal, important, influential piece of, of anime. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other stuff I got to keep track of, too. Um, there's there's the stuff in the video game world and content in general. Um, you know, they're going when new shows come out, they're going to reference characters from pro from popular live action movies and TV shows. So, you know, I better have watched my Avengers or else I'm not going to know who the hell they're referencing when they're talking about a certain character in a certain animated show or video game. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly consuming media and sort of parsing it and figuring it out. Uh, but anime is probably not as big 
a percentage of the media I consume as it might have been when I was younger. Yeah, uh, COVID has changed a lot. One of the things is that going into a studio is difficult because you know, the CDC likes to say, oh, you need a well-ventilated place with lots of room where you're six feet away from other people. And that's impossible in a studio, right? You're in a little padded room with no ventilation. <laughs> and there was somebody who was in it, you know, maybe five minutes before who was screaming their head off and, you know, spraying whatever they've got all over the walls. I mean, you know, it's, it's, not, it, it's not easy. The studios are doing a heroic job to try to make sure that they're safe, as, as safe as they can be. But I know for me, um, I'm just not comfortable. I'm not comfortable going in there. And I'm spoiled. Fortunately, I have a pretty pretty good booth at home that I can record in. And so I've just made the decision that I'm not willing to go into a studio uh, until I'm vaccinated. Uh, hopefully until we're all vaccinated, you know, and, and everything's really safe and reliable um, because the, the risks to me are, are too great. Um, you know, it's, even if I came down with a mild case of COVID, it could permanently alter my breathing um, and the sound of my voice. And so, you know, it's like, in, voices are delicate instruments. You know, if, if, if you ever follow like opera singers, you, they don't get enough sleep one night and forget it, they can't sing the opera, you know? So it's, it's, it's tough. Um, uh, so yeah, it's changed a lot. A lot more people are having to report from home um, and I'm having to coordinate, coordinate with studios. And luckily I'm pretty technically savvy, so I'm able to do stuff to make sure that I'm linking up to studios correctly. But I know uh, many voice actors aren't, and they've been having challenges trying to figure out all the technical stuff because I'm not only acting, I'm also engineering and IT department and, <laughs> and you know everything else to try to, make, to try to make that work. And you'll meet voice actors like me who are like that, who are, who are also actors and tech heads. Uh, but there are plenty of voice actors who aren't, and it's been really, really challenging for them. You know, it's funny, people ask me, you know, what's my inspiration from a voice acting perspective? And when I was young, I didn't really think about voice actors. It didn't, it didn't really, I wasn't aware of that as a thing. There are lots of people who, when they watch shows, animated shows, they would study the credits to figure out who the voice actors were and they followed their favorite voice actors. I didn't know anything about that. But what I did know is the characters and the vocal performances that really um, stayed with me. And if there's any animated shows that really sort of stuck with me, um, a lot of them are related to the Rankin Bass productions, specifically the animated version of The Hobbit. Um, Tolkien's writings in Middle Earth were always very near and dear to my heart, a big part of my upbringing. And that animated Hobbit movie um, is, some of the voice acting work in that is astounding. Um, Brother Theodore as Gollum is one of the scariest things I think I've ever heard. He's absolutely terrifying as Gollum. Um, and so there, there's stuff like that that certainly stuck with me. And, and Hans Conried, who most people know as Captain Hook from Disney's Peter Pan animated film, he played Thor and Oakenshield in that version of The Hobbit, you know? Um, and so I didn't know it at the time. It wasn't until late, later, but I realized that those voices really affected me um, in ways that I wasn't aware of at the time. The Last Unicorn was a big influence on me as a kid. Um, uh, Angela Lansbury does a great job, but Tammy Grimes as Molly Grew just wins the world. I, I, I have yet to hear a performance in animation that is as heartbreaking as Tammy Grimes as Molly Grew in The Last Unicorn. Um, but then you've got Christopher Lee playing Haggard and like oh, such good stuff. Um, so I think that's what happened is the, these characters would influence me and the sound of them got in my head and my heart even if i didn't know who the actor was who was playing them well one of my biggest challenges was when i made the move to from new york to los angeles so i started uh you know i went to grad school in columbia in new york city and then afterwards i stayed in new york to do theater and i was doing theater broadway off broadway regionally and that's when I got into starting to dub anime in New York City. And uh, I realized that I really wanted to pursue the voice acting more with, uh, I, I had more desire to pursue the voice acting than I did the theater. And so I had to make a decision. I decided, okay, we're gonna do the voice acting. And I realized that Los Angeles was gonna be a better place for me to do that. I had sort of maxed out in the New York marketplace. There wasn't much farther for me to go there. 
and LA was this untapped market. So I went to LA and I made friends with uh, some people in LA who were producers who were eager to work with me, which is great. And I got there and I auditioned for two different projects. One was uh, the Cowboy Bebop movie, uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door. And the other one was, I believe it was the fourth season of Digimon. And I got cast in both of them. And I got fired from both of them. <laughs> um, I mean, this is within like six months of being in LA, right? I, I got these jobs. And um, I was just a little miscast. And also I was not up to speed. I, I, my skills were just not professionally competitive with my Los Angeles colleagues. I just, I couldn't hit the fastballs yet. I wasn't there. Um, so uh, the the the, the uh, Cowboy Bebop movie, I was supposed to play the main villain in that. Um, and I just didn't sound heavy enough. I just didn't sound big enough. Um, and part of that is because I was younger. I was younger than the other actors who were playing the other main characters in Cowboy Bebop. So it, I didn't sound right. Um, but then in Digimon 2, there was a character that I was cast as and I was let go because I just could not perform well enough, believably enough for them to keep me. Ironically, months later, that same character had a twin, an identical twin. So I, I had been cast as the Digimon of Light and got fired. But then his twin, the Digimon of Darkness, showed up and I got cast as the Digimon of Darkness. So I wasn't good enough to play him, but I was good enough to play his twin brother, which is just shows that I had improved in my skills, that I had gotten better uh, because that's what that lesson taught me is that I, I showed up and got fired twice in a row and thought, I need to improve my skills. I am not, I am not professionally competitive. And so I took classes and followed every path I could to try to get my skills better. And then literally about, I don't know, I was, it was when I had been cast on Digimon and I was working with uh, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, who was the director on, on Digimon at the time. And, and worked on uh, the Cowboy Bebop movie, directly the Cowboy Bebop movie. And uh, and I said, ooh, listen, listen. And I started doing the villain uh, uh, from the Cowboy Bebop movie, Vincent. And I started doing his voice lines. And she goes, oh my God, that's so much better. How come you couldn't do that six months ago? And I was like, I, I, I didn't have the skills six months ago. I wasn't there yet. Um, so I think that any artist who is truly committed to their craft gets sort of the bit between their teeth when they can't do what they want to do, right? Rather than becoming discouraged and giving up, they usually get angry. <laughs> They're like, ah, how come I can't do this, right? There's a certain frustration and anger that shows up because you're not, you can't get the results you want. And so you, you, you sort of, mm, and that's that's sort of how I got when I got to LA. I mean, yes, there were many tears shed. Don't 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 get me wrong. I was very upset and felt very disappointed. But it, it, it very quickly turned into sort of this need, this anger, this frustration to figure out how this works. Damn it! <laughs> so I can do this. Um, and and you know that, that's that's a challenge. And I've been I, I've been let go from other projects too. It happens sometimes. Uh, you know, and and that's always a learning experience. Um, and I've been chosen to replace people in other projects, right? When when someone else didn't work and then I was brought in as the person to replace them. So it, it, it happens. I relate to all of my characters on a certain level because the thing about being a human being is that you get a universe inside of you. And what happens is we only share a small part of ourselves in the real world because we have to conform to society's expectations about how we behave, right? And depending on the part of the country you've been raised in or a different country altogether, you're going to speak and behave differently in order to fit in, right? Which, is a, which means that the way you present yourself as yourself, like the way I present myself as Crispin Freeman is like a small subset of the totality of me as a person, right? It's, it's, the, it's the part that, 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 that didn't get beat up after school. Like <laughs> this is the part that survived, right? But there's all these other parts that were not, that, that have not been expressed or explored because that wasn't allowed, you know? Um, I've played 
characters that are vicious murderers that rip people's heads off. You know, that, that was not allowed when I was in high school, right? <laughs> That's not, like, not something I'm gonna do. Um, and so um, part of it is saying, okay, what part of me identifies with this character? Can I bring that part of me forward and allow it to play pretend to give this character what it needs to be believable? Now, if what you're asking is, are there any characters who are very close to me in terms of ideology, in terms of how I like to present myself as a person? Absolutely. Uh, I think that probably the character that is closest to me, the closest to me sort of ideologically, would be Winston in Overwatch. And I think one of the fascinating things about the characters in Overwatch is that, call me crazy, it's my hallucination, you could probably go through the cast of Overwatch and many of the voice actors would say the exact same thing. Like that this character sort of embodies some essential part of them that they really appreciate. Like when I heard Matt Mercer talk about his appreciation for Americana for playing McCree, you know, and, and he really loves Western culture. And like, that's that's not a thing for me, but that is for him, that, that's totally a thing for him. For me, Winston's idealism, his, his, he is, either unable or unwilling to compromise his ideals. Um, and and he just, he can see things being so much better than they are. And he's not willing to let go of that as a dream. And that sort of indefatigable optimism about that, um, that's something that I identify with heavily because I, I often look around and think, oh, well, this would be a bad way to behave. We should all behave like this. Wouldn't that be wonderful and compassionate and, and uplifting? No, you're, you're gonna behave badly? Really? Oh, and, and you're gonna behave badly too? You're all gonna behave bad. Why are we behaving badly? Like it, like, it doesn't make sense to me sometimes. You know, I realize that a lot of times people behave badly out of pain. They're they're hurt or they're scared and, and, and so they behave badly. Um, but it, it just, it, 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 it seems like, um, that that that's that's I, I I always want to hold up those characters, right? Like Captain America, you know. I always want to hold up those kinds of characters, because so many times, even Superman, in you know, in all this Boy Scouty goodness, um, uh, that that they're they're so easy these days for people to ridicule them, because it's easy to make fun of sincerity. It's so easy to tease someone who's sincere. But it's the sincere people who actually care. And it's the sincere people that I think make things emotionally satisfying. So yeah, I would identify with Winston most definitely. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know if Winston has necessarily taught me lessons. Winston Winston is, it, what Winston goes through in, in the, animated shorts that we've made for the Overwatch game. Um, that's the only time I've ever choked up when I've been voice acting. I usually pride myself on being the consummate professional. Who, you know, I can scream my head off and then be chill, or I can weep and cry and then have a cup of coffee. Like, you know, like I can turn it on, turn off whenever I need to, because as an actor, you have to, you, you have to be able to, to uh, separate your artistry from your psychology. It's harder to do with Winston. <laughs> <laughs> there are times when I'm in the booth and like Tracer will, I can hear Tracer's voice in the recording because maybe they've uh, recorded Kara before us, before me. And she'll say, Winston, is that you, love? Oh, it's been too long. And like, and I'll just, I'll start to tear up because it's, it's, it's so wonderful to have something that's so sincere like this. So that's when I have to be like, uh, can I have a minute? Just give me a second. <sighs> okay, I'm back. You know, um, the characters that have probably taught me the most are the ones that are very different from me. Um, the irresponsible Captain Tyler taught me a lot uh, because I wanted to portray him so well. Most people would probably see me uh, personally in my own life uh, as uh, precise and philosophical and thoughtful and, and, um, and articulate. And Tyler is like, putting Winnie the Pooh in charge of a starship. Like, it, it, like he's so not that. He's about as intuitive as they come. And so playing Tyler and learning to play Tyler 
I think was, and striving to play Tyler, was a, a, a big learning experience for me. Uh, similarly with uh, um, Hideki in Chobits, when I was working on Chobits, very comedic show. And I hadn't done, uh, other than Tyler, I hadn't done a lot of comedy. Uh, and even when I had done comedy like The Slayers, where I played Selgadis, in The Slayers, I'm the straight man. I'm not the goofy character. I'm the grouchy one, right? And so t for Chobits to show up and for me to play Hideki in Chobits and to sort of let go of a lot of my technique and my skill and my polish and just sort of let it come out of me. And um, that, 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 that taught me a lot about relaxing as a character um, and not having to be in total control. And like, and Hideki, doesn't even know how to use computers. I have a, I have a degree in computer science. You know, like like the, the idea of being able to turn that part of my brain off and say, I don't know how a computer works. What is this Persicon? What do I do? You know, um, um, and and that was that was uh, a, a lesson and a gift as I was as I was playing him in Chobits. Well, I, I don't know if you're familiar, but I do do presentations on mythology. Uh, and how the different religious traditions of different cultures affect pop culture heroes. Um, and so uh, I have an entire website, uh, mythologyandmeaning.com, and I give, I give presentations on this, and there's a trailer on the website for the presentations. Obviously, it's been hard to do that during a pandemic, but uh, back when I was going to conventions and doing these presentations, I would talk about, um, you know, why do Americans write about superheroes and the Japanese write about giant robots? and why it has to do with the religious traditions from each culture and, and how that all shakes down. And whenever I begin one of my mythology presentations, I always say that they serve two purposes. One, obviously, is to expand people's artistry. I try to share this sort of blueprint of storytelling and character archetypes to help those who are artists who are trying to tell stories and develop characters, how to develop them uh, with more nuance and richness, especially from a mythological perspective, that if that's something they're interested in doing, right? It, it helps you write characters if you understand mythological hero journeys and, and things like that. And so that's the, that's the sort of obvious purpose on the surface. But the second purpose, and probably the most important one, is self-actualization, right? Self-improvement, if you want to say. Um, it is my firm belief that we become the stories we tell ourselves. And the stories that we repeat to ourselves over and over tend to manifest in our lives. And so if we want to become the authority for our own lives, literally, if we want to author our own lives, it behooves us to understand the structure of these stories so that we can rewrite them how we will. When I watched these anime stories when I was young, one of the reasons they appealed to me so strongly is because they they worked within a completely different cosmology. And the cosmology is the universe that a religion takes place in. And depending on how that universe is structured, physically, it helps determine what the hero is fighting for. Most of the storytelling that I had grown up in American animation worked within a dualistic universe, good and evil. And usually the heroes were on the good and the bad guys were evil. Well, the Japanese anime doesn't always conform to that. Often the good, the notion of good and evil is not dualistic. It's, it's far more nuanced and complicated than that. And it's closer to the notion of the, the yabyum, the yin yang symbol, right? Where the, where the light is in the dark and the dark is in the light. And even then we're talking about dark and light, not good and evil. In Taoism, the notion of yin and yang is that yin is not, uh, bad because it's dark and yang is good because it's light. No, that's, that's ridiculous. It's just yin is the shady side of the stream and yang is the sunny side of the stream. But you got to have both because if you have nothing but sun, it burns up. And if you have nothing but shade, it freezes over. So you, you there has to be some sort of balance between the two. One of the most fascinating anime stories that did this for me when I was young was Robotech. Specifically, um, the first saga of Robotech, which is based on the anime series Macross, the idea is that humans have this ship, this alien ship crash landed, they've reverse engineered the technology on it to make these planes that can transform into robots. And then 10 years after they do that, the aliens come looking for their tech 
and a, and a, and a, and a war ensues between the humans and the aliens. And the aliens are these Zentradi, and they've been bred for war. They're genetically programmed for war. And so how do you defeat them? Well, spoiler, I mean, Robotech's been out since the 80s, but the, the, the way you defeat them is not through force of arms. You do not overpower them with guns. The way you defeat them is by singing. These warlike aliens are disrupted by emotions. And so the, the, big, the strongest weapon that the humans have against them is this pop star who, when she sings her song, confuses them and makes them stop fighting. And the big battle that's supposed to be the sort of be-all, end-all, possibly destroy the Earth, happens like two-thirds of the way through the story. There's a whole nother, whoops, excuse me, there's a whole nother third of episodes that we have to get to, which is the fallout after the big battle. Can the Zentradi and the humans now live together after they've had this huge battle? Because one's not good and one's not evil. They've both got to figure out some way to coexist. That sort of nuance would show up repeatedly in anime. Not all anime. There are some anime that are very much, you know, good versus evil, sure. But the, the, all the anime that really spoke to me the most had this sort of more nuanced notion of things. That, that the villain was usually coming from someplace, even if they even if they were misguided, even if they were mistaken in their premises or their argument, they still felt justified. And you could look at them and say, yeah, I see how they feel justified. I disagree, but I can see how they feel justified as opposed to they're just evil. And it's like, well, that's not really, that's not my experience of life. You know, usually people who are doing what you might call evil things think they're justified. And so then you have to figure out, well, why do they feel they're justified? And is there a way to diffuse that? to short circuit that and say, no, that's not, that's not working. There's gotta be a better way. And often that's what I was finding in anime. And that's why it spoke to me on such a personal level. Mind you, it took me like a decade or more to figure this out. <laughs> like, like I had to sort of, why do I like this stuff so much? You know, it took me 20 years to articulate why I like animation more than live action. So, you know, it, it takes some introspection to really figure this stuff out. Sleep. I really like sleeping. Fan of sleep. Um, I try to find things that give me joy. Uh, it, it usually doesn't have to be a big thing, but something, especially that's a totem or something that signifies something bigger. Like, for instance, this this holiday season, I couldn't really go anywhere, and I didn't have the energy or the focus to like do a whole lot of decorating. But my wife was lovely enough to find this little tree that's like, I don't know, two feet tall. And it's designed to be a centerpiece on a table or something. And it's got some fake snow on it. It's got, it's flock, so it looks like it has snow encrusted on it. And it's got some berries and it's got lights in it. And so you throw in some AA batteries and you hit the button and it turns on and it looks like a little lit Christmas tree on your dining room table. I can't tell you how much joy just looking at that little thing gives to me, you know? And I think, you know, in the, in, the, in the past and often people think, oh, I need to have decorations everywhere, or I need the fastest car, or I need the biggest stuffed animal, or, you know, whatever it is in order to try to do that. And I realize I just don't. I just need the little things, a little something like that as a sort of totem as a sort of focal point. So maybe that's what it is. Because that's certainly something that I do when I, uh, to meditate. Usually when I'm feeling really messed up mentally, like I'm distracted and I can't focus and I'm, and I'm stressed out, I usually realize, okay, I need to sit for 15 minutes and just try to clear my head and meditate. Um, and usually I end up, things that are troubling me are the first things that come to my mind as I'm sitting to meditate. And I go, okay, I see that. Yeah, okay, okay. Yep, yep, that's there. I'll deal with that later. Yep, mm -hmm, okay, okay. And then eventually my mind and my breath will, will slow down a little bit and I'll get to a better place and I'm able to manage whatever that stress is better. Um, but honestly, for me, it is little things. It's little simple things that will often make me feel better. There was a time when I would, 
if I was having trouble going to sleep, I would put my little headphones in on my little iPod and I would listen to an audiobook of The Lord of the Rings because I grew up on Middle Earth. And so I know the story backwards and forwards, right? I can almost recite it at this point. And so listening to it is not, I'm not listening to it because I need to know what happens next. I'm listening to it because it's comforting, right? And then, and, and I'll, you know, I, they'll start talking about something and I'll go, oh yeah, hobbits, elves, and I'm gone, you know? Um, so yeah, meditation, sleep, and little, little focusing totems that, that bring me joy. I think one of the things that helped me improve my mental health was finding archetypal hero journeys in storytelling. So when I was in graduate school, in uh, for theater acting graduate school in New York City, graduate school, man, talk about stressful. You are not getting any sleep. You're trying to do all these performances. Literally, we'd like be trying to schedule rehearsals at between one and three in the morning. It was ridiculous. And 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 it, you're just a wreck trying to do all this and learn all this and accomplish this. And in the middle of all that, I had a little bit of a breakdown in that nothing seemed to be working. My artistry was terrible. My friendships were lacking no romantic relationships to speak of like that was a that was a distant mountain <laughs> when is that gonna happen? um and in the middle of all that i discovered two things one i rediscovered my appreciation for anime i had always been a fan of anime but when i graduated high school and went off to college i was in college between 90 and 94 and i we did not have much media at college because I didn't have really time to watch TV. And while the internet existed and I was on it, the World Wide Web did not. So even though I was a hacker and I was on Usenet and Archie and Veronica and all these bulletin board systems, there was no HTTP, there was no web to speak of. That didn't come until 95, until after I was out of college. And so I was disconnected from media. And then when I got to New York for grad school between 94 and 97, the sci-fi channel was playing something called Saturday morning anime. And uh, I was like, oh, anime. Yeah, I remember anime. Let me watch anime. And they were showing Lensman and um, Robot Carnival and Record of Lotus War. I mean, pretty cool shows, but old school. And they looked like Robotech to me. It looked like the same quality level. And I was like, but Robotech was like 15 years ago, guys. Like, I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago. I think we've, they've probably advanced since then. And luckily, there was a store in the East Village called Anime Crash. And they sold anime on VHS tapes. God forbid. And I went and I started, uh, I remember walking in the store and just being overwhelmed. I had no idea how much anime there was because all the anime I, I'd watched was on broadcast. And I walked in and was like, oh my God. And there was a guy there and I walked up to him, a salesman. And I said, what do you watch? He's like, me? I was like, yeah, what do you watch? I said, I watch Macross Plus. I said, well, then I give me one. And he said, okay, here's, here's the first episode of Macross Plus. Okay, great. You know, he said, like, there's, there's four episodes. Like four, I don't know. Just give me the first one, right? And I went on the subway. I went all the way back up to the Upper West Side in Manhattan, put the, the VCR on, watched it, got back on the subway, went all the way back down the East Village and said, give me all of them now. And of course, at the time, only the first three had been released. The fourth hadn't been released yet. And he's like, well, I can only give you two and three, four years now. Yeah, I was like, what do you mean it's not out? Who does that? Who doesn't release a whole, what? Like the whole idea of like release dates did not make sense to me at the time. Um, so why? Why was I so passionate about this? Well, it was the Robotech of my youth. Macross Plus was a sequel to the original Macross done by Shoshi Kawamori, different than Macross 7, which I think Kawamori had done some of the mechanical designs, but I don't think he'd been really involved in the storytelling. Um, but Macross Plus was his baby and you could feel it. It was so mythological. I mean, the whole thing starts on planet Eden, you know, I mean, come on. Um, and, and you have this Alpha and Omega thing going on and, and Sharon Apple. I mean, there's so much biblical imagery going on in this, in this story. At the same time that I was sort of rediscovering my passion for Robotech and all the stuff that I was subconsciously attracted to, I was also introduced to Joseph Campbell's scholarship on mythology and specifically his charting of the monomyth, the typical hero journey structure that repeats itself throughout different cultures and, and 
countries around the planet. So what Joseph Campbell did is he gave me a vocabulary to talk about these stories. He gave me a way for my conscious mind to parse and understand why my subconscious was so attracted to these stories. And that's when I realized, oh, these are stories of self-actualization. These are stories of, of uh, growing up and finding one's way in the world. Whether you're Bilbo Baggins, Harry Potter, Luke Skywalker, um, Rick Hunter in Robotech or whoever, um, that, that's what this is about. And I realized that I had been subconsciously modeling myself after characters I identify with. And is this not why people cosplay, right? Why do, why do people dress up in religious garb? Because they're trying to put themselves and their psyche in alignment with the wisdom of their religion. Why do people dress up as the characters and the stories they like? Because they're trying to put their psyche in alignment with the wisdom of the story they have watched. Because the story speaks to them on some deep level. So that's when I went, okay, so who do I identify with? I identify with the elves of Middle Earth. Why is that? I also identify with Aragorn. Okay, let me try to unpack this and figure out what's going on and where is this all coming from and what can I learn from their behavior and what they do and how they behave, you know, and the challenges that they face and where they may fall short, you know? I really identify with Aragorn where in, in the two towers, they stop um at tall brandir and they have they have to make a decision do they go to mordor or do they go to minas tirith to gondor to help boromir you know and and frodo says i don't know i i need to go think and aragorn goes okay and then boromir tries to take the ring and all hell breaks loose and aragorn is running around trying to save everybody and he basically says you know all i do is a miss no aragorn all you've done up to this point is really pretty good right you've been a pretty good hero so far you know, you, you, you've had one major stumble here and it wasn't even necessarily your fault. You warned Gandalf about the Mines of Moria. Um, and, 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 and still he's beating himself up because he's not perfect, right? And then he has this choice. He goes, okay, do I follow Frodo and Samwise into Mordor or do I try to save Merry and Pippin from the orcs? And any tactician would say, ring that needs to be destroyed to save the world two random hobbits, which do you choose, right? Any tactician would say, go after the ring. Make sure it's safe. What does he do? He goes after Merry and Pippin. Why? He will not leave them to die at the hands of the orcs. He chooses compassion over strategy. Wow, okay. That's an interesting choice to make in a, in a moment of crisis, you know? Um, and and you and that's a thing that, that Tolkien puts through all of his stories is that anytime a, char a character always ends up choosing compassion over over the uh, tactics you know when Gollum attacks them at Mount Doom Sam should crush his skull he doesn't because he has compassion right um and so and so that sort of wisdom it comes through the storytelling not because you get fabulistic aphorisms you know a stitch in time saves nine you don't get it because of what the characters are saying you get it by what they're doing it's their behavior that impacts you. It was their behavior that I could model and say, okay, when in this sort of horrible place, how do these characters get their way out of it? How do they figure their way out of it? Maybe I can walk in their paths. And that's the, the quote that Joseph Campbell uses about the, the trying to get out of the labyrinth, right? The, the, he says the labyrinth is thoroughly known, right? The, 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 because the heroes of all time have gone before us. And so you need only follow the thread of the hero path. The hero path is there. It's this wisdom story to try to help you to find what you need in order to feel better, in order to actualize, in order to live a more fulfilling life. And those stories are all around you in all sorts of different genres and cultures. And you just need to tease that thread out of the story and apply it to your life easier said than done. I think what you're doing is incredibly noble. And uh, I, it's, it's wonderful that uh, how you want to reach out and help people. And I think that stories absolutely can help people. Um, the only thing that I would add is that I would hope 
stories, stories can be consolation. Stories can be escapism. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Sometimes escapism is what you need, especially in really tough times. But I would hope that people would realize that the wisdom in these stories is also applicable outside of the stories. You don't have to just spend all your time living in the story, that there is no satisfaction to be had outside the story. The story is a metaphor. It is a distillation of beliefs and values and wisdom. And it is not the world, right? It, it is, it is, a, it is an, um, uh, a, a metaphor for the world. And, but the wisdom in it can be applied to the world. And when you do, you can have experiences that are just as magical in the real world that you get to author yourself. You don't always have to rely on somebody else. I've watched sometimes somebody will get really excited about a certain fandom and they'll get really into like Harry Potter and they'll be all down Harry Potter and then all the Harry Potter books were finished and all the movies had come out and there basically wasn't a whole lot more Harry Potter to be had, right? Like, like it's sort of done at that point, you know? I mean, yes, there's been stuff since, but at that, there was a point after the last book and the last film where it was like, okay. And they're like, I've got to have my next fandom. What's next? Game of Thrones? Like, they, 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 like there was a compulsion there to just hide in these worlds, and I'm and and I and I just wanted to say, yeah, but can you apply that? Can you apply what Harry Potter taught you about the world? Can 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 you can you make that kind of magic in your own life? What does your Patronus look like? Right? What does it mean to save yourself with your own Patronus? Can you do that, right? I, I believe anyone can. And so maybe the better question is, how does one do that, right? How, how do you accomplish that? Um, so that would be my thing. Love the stories. Happy to, to go down the rabbit hole. We'll fall asleep listening to Lord of the Rings for years and years and years. But then I do wake up. And what I do is the calm and the peace and the wisdom that I might have absorbed subconsciously, I try to apply in my conscious life. And that brings the magic home. The synchronicity becomes personal because you can create your own alchemy of life that can be fulfilled. You need not always rely on other people's wisdom. on a little like fun question section okay um so our first question is that um we know you voiced Itachi and Naruto um besides him who would you say your favorite character is from that show from Naruto mm -hmm. well I, I will be I'll be honest I don't know the vast scope of the characters right mm -hmm. but of the ones that I have seen I am sort of fond of Jiraiya He's sort of he's sort of playful, in in a, in a sort of fun way, in, especially in a place where everyone is taking themselves so seriously, <laughs> which is hilarious. Because come on, ninjas wearing orange really is that a good tactic, right? Should ninjas be wearing orange if they want to be stealthy? I don't maybe I don't know. Possible questionable. Um, um, yeah, I think Jiraiya is fun. Jiraiya is fun. But yeah, I do. I mean, Atachi. When I I, I didn't. You understand, I first got cast in, in Naruto as Ebisu. And and he's, you know, this crazy teacher who's also sort of lecherous and getting nosebleeds. And it was fun to play Ebisu in the first couple episodes. And then he disappeared. And I thought, well, that was my time on Naruto. Guess I'm done, right? Because I, I mean, I thought, and everyone's working on it. You have to understand, like, everyone in LA is getting cast in the show because there's so many characters. And I thought, oh, I guess they, I guess I'm not going to do any more Naruto. And then, like, late in the game, episode 80 or whatever it was, and, and Mary Elizabeth McGuinn calls me back in to play Itachi. And I'm like, Itachi, who's it? He can't be that important, 
you know, he's coming in like episode 80. Like, this has got to be a nobody. Oh, he's Sasuke's brother. Oh, oh, he's the leader of the Akatsuki. Uh, uh, wait a minute, play the video? Oh. Oh, I see what's going on. <laughs> That's when I went. Oh, right. And at the time, Mary Elizabeth had these pins that she had gotten for all the major Naruto characters. And she had given these pins out to everybody. That's, you know, Naruto and Sasuke and Sakura and everybody else. And then I came in and she was like, I was one of the last pins because Itachi comes in so late in the game. And she was like, basically, Pikachu, I choose you. And she can see this pin. And I'm like, I'm so confused. What, what are we doing? Why does my character matter? And then she shows me and I'm like, oh, that's why I matter. Got it. And then it was like, yeah, that's that's who I should be playing, right? That's that's yeah itachi makes perfect sense to me i'm i'm all in he's 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 my guy <laughs> um yeah that makes sense um would you say um is there a character that you get most like recognized for if that makes sense if i get recognized i mean that's one of the joys of being a voice actor mm -hmm. is i can walk down the street and not be recognized which you know and then the internet happened and then that changed things um uh where I, literally i was recognized by sight in a parking lot in Montana. <laughs> yeah, like in the rain. Like I, I went out to go get in my car and this poor girl came knocking on my window in my car. It's Montana, you know, everyone's pretty friendly. And I was just like, um, hi, it's raining. What do you need? What's something wrong? She's like, are you Crispin Freeman? And I was like, how, what? Yes, I, wait, she's like, if I go inside and buy a Helsing manga, will you sign it for me? <laughs> I was like, sure how did you find me right um so uh nowadays i think the voice obviously probably the most the voice i'm most well known for is probably winston overwatch just because overwatch has such a huge reach I, I can tell by what i have to sign at conventions so there was a time at conventions when certain characters would sort of come in and out of vogue right and certain characters would be very popular certain characters not so much um, uh, Itachi, obviously, you do 10 years of Naruto, that character's, somebody's gonna like that character, right? Um, just from exposure, if nothing else. Um, and, and so, you know, Itachi is always, is always a big character, but Overwatch, Winston, that, that, uh, that, there were, before the pandemic, it was getting to the point where a good third of the things I were signing were Winston things. And, and there were times it was almost half no character I've ever had has taken over my sort of resume <laughs> the way Winston has. You know, and that might not be the case forever. That that, that might change. There might there might be something else that comes along that, 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 you know, or it may just balance out. Winston will become one. But the, the big ones are usually Winston, Itachi, Alucard, and Helsing. Those are sort of, sort of the, the big ones. Young Justice sometimes. All the, all the different Harpers that I play in Young Justice. Roy, Will, Jim, lots of Harpers. That makes sense. Um, for this last bit, we're gonna play a little game. Um, we're just gonna quote um, something from a character you voice and you have to guess which character it was. Oh dear God. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll start with the first one. Um, my voice acting isn't good, so I'm just gonna like read the line. Um, oh, you're a perfect you voice, say... <laughs> voice match for me. What are you talking about? You're gonna take my job. <laughs> um, orange, you say, that's the name of my loyalty. Orange, you say? That is the name of my loyalty. Yes, of course, that's Orange Boy, Jeremiah Goswold. All hail Ooh. Britannia. Love it, invested. I just, um, okay, so the next one is, um, you call my master a so and expect me to let you live. I'm afraid I'm just going to have to put a bullet in your head. Yes, but it's so. <laughs> you call my master a so. I'm just going to have to put a bullet in your head. That would be a la carte. Oh, did we lose Heather? The internet connection choke on us. I called her a sow and she hung up. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, it looks like we did lose Heather a little I bit. I believe so. <laughs> Is she the only one with the quotes? No, we have Oh, oh no, <laughs> oh, no we have them well, too. <laughs> all um, right. Would you like to oh. go ahead, Osama? Oh, oh, there she is. Back. There, 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 there she is. <laughs> Guys, I disappeared. That's all right. Did you hear my response? No. Oh, I was just, I was gonna say yes, but it's pronounced sow. 
Okay, I knew I was reading it wrong. You call my master a sow? <laughs> I have to put a bullet in your head. That would oh, be cool. uh, <clears throat> True change cannot be made if it is bound by laws and limitations, predictions, and Im imagination. Wow, that's a tricky one. True change cannot be made by what? If it is bound by laws and limitations, predictions and imagination. Whoa. I don't know. I'm obviously one of my darker characters. It could be Itachi. Yeah, I think it's, I was about to say, it's either Itachi or Fuma from X. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like Itachi. Yep. Um, and also, I know earlier you mentioned your website, mythologyandmeeting.com. Mm -hmm. I found all of that stuff so interesting, and I think other people will too, so people should check that out. Um, thank you again, Crispin, and thank you for tuning in. You're welcome. I also have another website, uh, Voice Acting Mastery, uh, for anyone who may be interested in pursuing voice acting. Um, it's a podcast that I've been running for almost 10 years now. It started in the summer of 2011. So uh, if people are interested in, in sort of uh, learning more about voice acting as a profession, uh, they can check out voiceactingmaster.com and listen to the podcast.